Okay, um, next we have Piotr, who will talk about uh, Morava K theory and filtrations by powers. So, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, giving me a chance to speak at the ECHD. I, uh, I went to grad school in the Midwest, and I think one of the best parts of being in the grad school in the Midwest is that you get to keep meeting Midwest people every two months, every three months. But then I moved to Copenhagen after graduation in the pandemic, and somehow some of you are familiar faces and I didn't see you for two years, so I'm really happy for a, for a chance to speak here. Everything I will talk about today is uh, joint work with uh, Toby, Toby Barthel. And um, there are, if we're interested in the homotopy of the sphere, then the two standard approaches to computing it, well, the standard approach is a spectral sequence, but there's two uh, main spectral sequences used to compute it. The first one is the classical Adam spectral sequence, by which I mean the Adam spectral sequence based on the eilenberg maclean spectrum. And that works very well at prime two. At out primes, the better method to, uh, com to compute the homotopy of the sphere is to work with the adams novikov spectral sequence, which is the Adams spectral sequence based on Brown Peterson spectrum. But the important part about having two different methods, like two different ways of taking a crack at the sphere is that you can compare them. And one of the first ways to get some relation between these two spectral sequences was uh, the Miller square from uh, Heinz Miller, I think 1984 paper on the relation between Adam spectral sequences. And what Miller does is he constructs two different, two additional spectral sequences, namely the Mahowat spectral sequence and the May spectral sequence with the same E2 term converging respectively to the Adam's E2 term and the uh, Adams Novikov E2 term. So you have a square which starts with the same thing, then it converges in two different ways to two different E2 terms, and then they both again approximate the homotopy of the sphere. So, what are the spectral sequences here? Uh, as part of this project, we really try to understand what Miller did. It's, it's an ingenious idea. So, for the May spectral sequence, the Adams Novikov E2 term that's given by the Cobar complex, which is the homotopy of uh, homotopy of some tensor products of a mu of itself. But this now has the HFP Adams filtration. So you get a filtration on the Adams E1 term, and that gives a spectral sequence computing the Adams E2 term. So this is also sometimes called, I think, the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence. But it arises by filtering the Adams, e, the Adams Novikov E1 term using the Adams filtration. Then on the other hand, we have the Mahowat spectral sequence, which instead arises by observing that the Adams Novikov resolution, if you apply mod P homology, that gives you the resolution of the homotopy of this of the homology of the sphere. It's not an injective resolution anymore, but you still get a spectral sequence. And it turns out this is actually the carton eilenberg spectral sequence. Associated to the extension, where we have the inclusion of the polynomial dual student algebra into the dual student algebra, where the quotient is this exterior thing. So another proof is that this square is commutative in a certain sense. What he proves formally is under the assumption that the carton eilenberg spectral sequence collapses, which happens at all odd primes for algebraic reasons that don't have, uh, it's an argument of Ravenel that there's an additional gradient that forces it to collapse. And he shows under this assumption, essentially the May spectral sequence, the D2 differentials agree with those in the Adams spectral sequence. It's not quite that easy because these two spectral sequences have different E2 terms. So there's a more precise statement about filtrations and one element belonging to the coset of another. And using this, he was able to prove uh, the telescope conjecture uh, at height one and odd primes. 
There is, of course, more going into the proof of the telescope conjecture, but the powerful thing about this method is that the differentials in the Adam spectral sequence are just so difficult to compute. And this gives you one way to determine them algebraically by comparing them to the, the differentials in the main spectral sequence. So it works well for D2, and you would hope you can generalize this to all higher differentials. And it turns out it's actually very difficult. Uh, me and Toby, we, Miller's method is ingenious and everything is super concrete, the, the proof of this theorem. And you'd really think that if you work hard enough, you can at least do D3 and, and well, we couldn't. <laughs> um, so instead there's other methods. There's the method due to Isaacson, Wang Shu, uh, Bogdan Korg, uh, where instead of working directly with the Miller square, they construct what they call the motivic square where there's another spectral sequence, namely the motivic Adam spectral sequence, which maps into both the topological one and uh, a certain algebraic spectral sequence. I think it's the algebraic Novikov in this case, mm. but I wanna be quoting on this perhaps. And that allows you to get relations on all higher differentials because now you have a span of spectral sequences but all differentials commute with each other. These are honest homomorphism of spectral sequences. So you can lift a differential from one spectral sequence to another and deduce differentials on the other side. So the question is, what if you try to do something like that for finite height? So you're not looking at the homotopy of the sphere. Now we're looking at the homotopy of the K and local sphere. So of course there's some things uh, fixed here. We're gonna we fix the prime, now we're gonna fix the finite height. So in this case, there is an K local analog of the adams novikov spectral sequence. And what this is gonna be, and that's actually very well studied, this is the K local Adams spectral sequence based on the Morava E theory spectrum. K local here means that after you write down the standard resolution using Morava E theory, you have to K localize everything again. It's, it's usually not K local before that. And then there's the analog of the K local atom spectral sequence. And that turned out is quite a bit less studied than it's either classical Adams cousin or the finite height Adams Novikov. And what we're gonna take this analog that's gonna be just the atom spectral sequence based on Morava K theory itself. So this here is Morava K theory. And we're gonna, in a second, we're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna make, make precise what do we mean by Morava K theory. Because as it turns out, and that's somehow what's part that makes this picture in some ways simpler than infinite height, in some ways more interesting. And one thing that makes it slightly more interesting is that there are choices involved. And mind you, the spectral sequence itself doesn't depend on any choices and we'll discuss it a little bit more down the line. But the choice of these rings of Morava E theory and of Morava K theory, that as it turns out, there's no uh, canonical way to do so. It always requires some choice, more or less. And we're gonna, it's a very fun game to see where exactly choices appear and where exactly the answers don't depend on them. So the, the basic choice you have to make is that you wanna start with a perfect field and you wanna start with a formal group of finite height over that perfect field. So that's, that's the choice at infinite height the canonical choices say the additive formal group, and that gives you the Adams uh, spectral sequence. At finite height, there's a choice to be made. Choose a perfect field, choose a finite height uh, formal group over it. Once you do that, the lubin tate theory is gonna produce for you a complete local ring, E0, uh, with maximal ideal M, such that E0 mod M is K, and there's gonna be a universal deformation G of G0, which lives over that ring E0. And 
this ring is actually canonical and functorial in both the choice of the form of the perfect field and of the formal group. But non-canonically, if just, just so interested in how it looks, this ring E0 always looks like the vid vectors of K. And then you have to attach UN minus uh, two parameters, power series parameters. That's the complete local ring. But this isomorphism is somehow helpful to know it exists. It tells you it's a regular complete local ring of characteristic zero, but it's not uh, an isomorphism that's functorial in the formal group. So that's what algebra tells you. But then you also have Gors, Hopkins, Miller. And more recently, there's, there was a lot of work by Luria about this. And that turns this complete local ring and produces for you a canonical, that's a very interesting part, E infinity uh, ring spectrum. I'm just gonna denote it by E, but it does depend on the field. It does depend on the formal group. And this is even periodic with, uh, with the associate formal group E zero of CP infinity is exactly the universal deformation. So Gors, Hopkin and Miller, they proved that there exists a canonical infinity ring spectrum functorial in the formal group associated to this situation. And then Lurie more recently uh, proved that this spectrum has a canonical universal property. He gave a different proof on existence by writing down a functor on K and locally infinity rings co-represented by this specific one and showing it as a canonical solution. Are there any questions so far? And this is not as, I, I like to compare this picture to what happens at infinite height. In this case, Morava E theory or Lubin Tate theory is better behaved. MU is infinity, but it's harder to explain. Is it uniquely infinity? For example, I think that's a recent result of uh, Jeremy Hamm and co-authors. Jeremy, are you here? That the periodic MU already admits two different infinity ring structures. So it is infinity, which helps, but it's not necessarily canonically infinity. Or it's infinity for it's due to its relation to complex manifolds, not due to its relationship to formal groups. Okay, and now we come to the crucial definition is what is a Morava K theory? And the definition is that this is an E1 algebra over uh, a fixed Lubin Tate ring such that the unit induces an isomorphism uh, of its homotopy groups with the homotopy groups of the Lubin Tate spectrum modulo the maximal ideal. So notice this means in particular that this homotopy groups is this perfect field I join a single uh, invertible generator even degree. Again, this isomorphism, the first isomorphism is canonical, while the second one is not. It requires you to choose a unit of degree two. So informally, this is like a residue field of, uh, of your Lubin Tate ring. Its formal group is exactly the formal group you started with, but there are some big differences. And this is the part where things get worse than what happens at the infinite height. So one thing is that uh, no canonical choice. Although it does happen that they are all equivalent as E modules. Not just as spectra, they're all equivalent as E modules, but they are never E2. And uh, never E2 is perhaps uh, understandable. An E2 ring spectrum of characteristic P would already be a module over the Einberg MacLean spectrum, but it's even worse than that. Namely, if P is 2, they are never even, uh, never homotopy commutative. And these are the aspects of this situation which are significantly worse. Somehow at infinite height, the Einberg maclean spectrum actually is canonically infinity. And is somehow, if you wanted to make it functorial in the field, you could, instead of working with FP. And it is E infinity, while these guys at prime two, 
aren't even homotopy commutative. There is no choice that would make them homotopy commutative. And by no canonical, I mean, there's usually uncountable many equivalence classes of Morava K theories as E1 algebras. Uh, not, although they are all equivalent as E modules. Okay, so here's, here's the question now. Can we describe, that's what we started working with, the Adam spectral sequence based on K? So how do you begin describing uh, the Adam spectral sequence? Well, the E2 term that's going to be, have something to do with co modules over the Hobb algebra of cooperations. So what we're gonna begin now is we're gonna, let's describe what's the Hobb algebra. What is the dual standard algebra, if you like, associated to Morava K theory? So as it happens here, I, I fixed M Morava K theory. There is no canonical choice, let's fix one. And what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a short exact sequence, which is canonical. On one hand, we have the thing we're interested in in the middle. These are the Morava K3 cooperations. And inside this, we have this, what happens to be uh, actually a subalgebra, the K homology of the Morava e, of the Lubin Tate spectrum. That is canonically a subalgebra. Well, the quotient of that, that's a little bit more interesting. So I use this letter E, but what I mean by that, this is the, homology relative to E. So these are the homo this is the homotopy not of K tensor K, but rather K tensor K over E. And as we verify in this paper, it's not particularly difficult. This is a short exact sequence of Hopp algebraids in the usual sense. With the caveat is that this ring doesn't have to be commutative. K star K is not, we don't know if it's commutative actually. That's an interesting question here. I'll, I'll add about this a little bit later. I think that's an interesting question. Is it always commutative? Often it is. For example, if your K is homotopy commutative, then it will be. But we don't know if it's commutative in general. So as you can see from my choice of colors, one of these guys is better than the other. Namely, K star E is by flatness, you can show it's actually just uh, the Hopp algebra associated to the Lubin Tate spectrum itself, uh, modded out by the maximal ATL using just flatness. And this tells you, for example, this doesn't depend on the choice of K. As a Hopp algebra, this is again a Hopp algebra over K star, <laughs> and it doesn't depend on that choice. It does depend on the choice of an E, but that choice is also mild because up to equivalent up to Morita equivalence of Hopp algebraids or equivalence of stacks, this Hopp algebra presents the moduli stack of formal groups of height m. So up to equivalence doesn't it depend on E either. It only depends on the prime, it only depends on the height. In particular, its cohomology only depends on the prime and height. So what about this red guy? The red guy is the part that somehow does depend on K, but as it turns out, it doesn't depend on it up to isomorphism. It's a theorem of Hopkins and Lurie that non-canonically it is an exterior algebra as a Hopkins algebra. In particular, it is commutative as well. That's why I think it's an interesting question if the thing in the middle is always commutative too. It is a short exact, it is an extension of two things which are commutative, but this, this red thing is somehow commutative because it's, the proof is not particularly enlightening. It's not commutative because it has to be. There's just very few isomorphous classes of finite dimensional of algebras in this case that would fit and it has to be the exterior algebra. But the more interesting thing is that the algebra structure on, uh, on this homology is of less importance to us. We care about the co-algebra structure and that's dual to the K cohomology, to the endomorphisms. And this turns out it actually doesn't depend on any choices again, because what you can do now is you can write down, and that's an idea to do Hopkins and Lurie essentially, 
let's look at modules over these finite dimensional uh, COP algebra, the cohomology. And that's going to be the same as product preserving free sheaves on finite sums of K as D modules, value to abelian groups. That is some form of uh, recognizing that this abelian category has compact projective generators, the category of modules, so it can be described uh, as product preserving pre -sheaves. But now this, instead of saying finite sums of K, we can say D modules equivalent to finite sums of K. And these are precious of abelian groups. And now the importance here is that this thing now, because all Morava K theories are equivalent to each other, doesn't depend on K. And this, this category here, uh, let me advertise this work maybe in a more flashy color. This category here is what Hopkins and Lurie Cormilner modules. This is the thing they used to classify different Morava K theories by studying their Milner module. They built an abstraction theory for constructing Morava K theories based where the abstraction groups are computed in Milner modules. Another interesting thing is that this is, if you write down an explicit equivalence here, which is not the one I used, it's slightly different. This is always monoidal, but not symmetric monoidal unless k homotopy commutative. We'll come back a little bit later to this point. And the, the nice thing about this, of writing it like this as Milner modules, is that they actually do compute cohomology of this. So Hopkins-Lurie, they show that uh, the X groups and Milner modules from the monoidal unit to itself, which is the cohomology of this Hopf algebra, according to this isomorphism, that's actually the symmetric algebra on the uh, on the cotangent space in the Lubin Tate ring. So this identification here is uh, somewhat important, and this tells you. This is the uh, this is the cohomology also of com modules over this red thing, which we don't understand very well. And again, we see this com module cohomology doesn't depend on the choice of K. It's another thing where somehow it could, but it doesn't. Okay, so we have the carton eilenberg spectral sequence. And first, if you want to compute this, then you want to make a choice of a formal group. So let's make the standard choice here. K is going to be the field with P to the N elements, and G0 is going to be the Honda formal group. One. So, in this case, once you make these choices, then this thing is just continuous functions on the Morava stabilizer group valued in K star. This is not always true, but it's true for this specific choice of the of uh, a formal group. And this allows you to identify this carton eilenberg spectral sequence that we make maybe. You see that, and I knew it's gonna be troublesome to gauge how much space I will need. But let's see how in a different color, how this thing looks like carton eilenberg It's gonna be the cohomology of GN with coefficients in this symmetric algebra. K zero, K star. And that computes these X groups and K star K commodities. So going for these identifications, you actually get a very explicit description of how this carton Eilenberg spectral sequence looks like. It really is the spectral sequence you get by filtering, uh, well, uh, let me stop myself there and just wait a little bit second. But Notice the E1 term of the carton eilenberg spectral sequence looks as if you were filtering E star by powers of the maximal ideal, and you got the associated gradient. 
and that's going to be the second spectral sequence. So now let's, let's talk about the k-based uh, Adam spectral sequence. So one observation we made is that this actually always converges. That's another property of finite heights, which doesn't happen at infinite heights. For any k local spectrum, the k-based Adam spectral sequence converges conditionally. And it's not, it's not that difficult. We were very surprised that this somehow didn't appear in literature already. So you only have to show that the map from the localization of X into the limit of its Adams resolution is uh, a K star isomorphism. But the thing with K star isomorphisms is that it's very easy to check because that's a field. So you can tensor with any finite spec with any non-zero spectrum. So this can be checked after tensoring with uh, a finite complex of pi 10. That's the color. And once you, and that's a finite spectrum. So tensoring with that is an exact functor. So you can commute this whole big limit, the whole Adams resolution for tensoring with this finite spectrum. But now you have something of height n, and for these things, it's known that it converges. It's in the book of uh, Strickland. And so some of the big difference here is that uh, at finite height, you're always a finite spectrum away of something for which you will have a finite, uh, you will actually have a uh, horizontal vanishing line on the E2 page. So there's something I wanted to say here about Miller's spectral sequence, but now I think we might leave that for later. Let's take a look at the K local Miller square because that's where the real fun begins. So how does this thing look like? Well, we have this carton eilenberg spectral sequence, which is the same E2 term uh, as uh, the filtration by power spectral sequence where you want to compute the cohomology of the Morava stabilizer group with coefficients in the lubin tate ring, and you filter it by powers. And at the bottom, you have the K-local Adam Snovikov and just the K-based ASS. So that's the situation we're in. And similarly to, uh, to what happens at infinite height, carton eilenberg always collapses at odd primes by the same argument. So we're in the situation of applying Miller's theorem. It gives you relations between differentials in K-based Adam spectral sequence and the relations in the filtration by power spectral sequence. But what happens even more, uh, what doesn't happen at finite height is that the adams novikov tends to collapse a lot. So this collapses when 2p minus 2 is larger uh, than n squared plus n. This is the so-called large prime situation. And then the adams novikov collapses. So now we're in a situation where we have a square of spectral sequences and we two of them collapse. So what else could happen than for these two to be isomorphic? And that's what is a situation where we just try to generalize Miller's proof, knowing that one of these, that two of these collapse and see if we can get a mm, relation on higher differentials, but we were very unsuccessful. But luckily we found a different method and we proved uh, the following. So that's uh, our theorem. If we're in this situation when both of them collapse, then uh, the K-based Adam spectral sequence is isomorphic to the filtration by powers. spectral sequence. The proof, it's, uh, it uses very different ingredients than you would guess, very different methods than what Miller did. You use, uh, in this range, you can give an algebraic description of the chromatic of the e local category. So use chromatic algebraicity to pass to E star E modules. You can work instead. That was a suggestion of my colleague Robert Birkland that chromatic algebraists will allow you to pass to historical modules. 
And because atom spectral sequences only depend on a class of injectives, you can identify the K-based atoms with something algebraic. But the hard part is that if you analyze what the spectral sequence is, it's not actually the same as filtration by powers. It's E1 term is quite, quite a bit different than the natural filtration you would get from filtering E star. So after that, you have to use a form of the collage construction where you don't quite compare, you have two different resolutions and they have different E1 term, but they happen to agree after you take the decalage. And it's somewhat interesting because it's the decalage with respect to the T structure on the derived category, which is very different from the one you used on spectra. It's not controlled by the homotopy groups. It's rather controlled by homology groups. So there's a, something really interesting going on here. I haven't seen this homological form of decalage appearing in the literature yet. So let's see how does K-based atoms look like if we're say uh, the simplest situation, N1 P equals large. So in this case, we're gonna have the cohomology of the p-adics, of the units in the p-adics, and we're gonna have this associated graded of p-adics, which is a polynomial ring plus, plus uh, an invertible generator, and that now tries to compute the cohomology of the p in the Lubin Tatron. And this again, this is uh, this is actually the spectral sequence based on more of a K theory at this height. So in other words, where we're just doing this, this is the P Bockstein computing the homotopy of the K local sphere. So I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, my guess is that yes, here's one. There's a single element zeta here. We have a polynomial B0, and then it's not quite U which survives to the E1 term, uh, to the E2 term, but instead we have B1, which is U to P minus one. Then we have B1 squared, B1 to the P power, and so on. And there are no differentials here. Not quite sure how to draw this. No differentials in this region, because we have a copy of the P adix in pi zero, so there, that copy of the p has to survive. And that creates, interestingly, another copy of the p the one generated by Zeta. And then in other columns, we have non-zero differentials. Generically, they're of length two. So they look like this. And because B0 is a permanent cycle, they're all going to go up by like this. And you're left with one copy of uh, Z mod P. Then instead, whenever V1, you have a P power of V1, the differentials get longer. For example, for the V1 P power, we get a differential of length three, and there's actually a copy of Z mod P squared. So this is the J pattern. It's something very classical, and now we know this is exactly what the spectral sequence based on Morava K3 would give you. It would just give you this classical calculation. So one interesting thing is to notice that there are in fact differentials of arbitrary length and the spectral sequence based on more of a K theory. It does converge at least conditionally and for the sphere strongly uh, for any K local spectrum, but it doesn't do it in the same way Adam Snovikov does. Adam Snovikov, there's an upper bound and on the finite page, it always will collapse for any finite spectrum. Uh, I think that's actually true for any spectrum. It always collapses at the finite page. Morava K theory ASS always converges, never collapses at the finite page, unless you have, you're a complex of type M. Another thing is that at height one, it happens to be the P Bockstein, but it wouldn't be at higher heights. This, this module M mod M squared, it's generated by P at height one. So that's a trivial GN representation, but it's non-trivial at higher heights. So there's some hope that this could be more efficient than trying to do two Bockstein at one, one after another at higher heights. But I once talked to Mark Perens about this, and he told me that if you can split one spectral sequence into two spectral sequences, one followed by the other, it will virtually never be the case that it will be easier to do two at once. Well, I mean, this is something generally different than doing Bockstein's one at once at, uh, at height uh, greater than one. So one thing which we see from here, which is actually this observation that uh, made us think about the spectral sequence based on more of a K theory is that you see that after you invert P, after you zero localize uh, the K1 local sphere, 
you get two copies of the P complete sphere, one generated by one and one generated by Zeta. And there's a whole web of conjectures uh, due to Hopkins chromatic splitting, which roughly there's more than one conjecture and some of them turn out to be true and sometimes you have to correct it a little bit, you have to be careful, but roughly they describe uh, the T chromatic localization of the K local sphere for T uh, smaller than N. And this is a particular, and what it does, it does describe it as um, wedges of, um, of just the uh, KT locus here, if I remember correctly. That's true, at least for when you when T is equal to zero, please forgive me uh, if it's not quite, it's, Rationally, it tells you that the rational homotopy of the Kane local sphere should be an exterior algebra on n generators. And then there's a more complicated conjecture as what if you don't rationalize, but maybe you pass to some other chromatic localizations that I'm not quite remembering now. But one question you may ask here, and that's what led us to thinking about this. Here, you compute this by just computing what this Kane local sphere is. You identify its homotopy, but homotopy is so hard. So one question you might have, and that was also an idea due to, due to Hopkins. Yeah. So what if we try to compute the homology instead of these, uh, of these chromatic localizations? And it turns out there's like a formal framework to do this. So there's a nice homology theory and we have taken E homology, which is a map from E local spectra, and it goes into E star eco modules. And that actually gives you a spectral sequence. Whenever you have a, a, a diagram of spectra and you're interested in the E homology of the limit, let's say E star X alpha, there's a spectral sequence computing that, where you have the derived functors of the limit in E star eco modules. Excel. And this, uh, the S actually lowers the degree. It's a, it's a star minus S. That's how the convergence works. And the way you might want to admit it here is you can write the K and locus here as the limit. Let's say we're at large primes of some spectra where we mod up by uh, P up to some power and then we model it by v1 up to some power and so on and that's oh and that's not the k local sphere here you just take the e and local sphere mm, sorry and that's going to give you a spectral sequence now let's see how the spectral sequence looks like at least if you're at large primes when everything exists uh, all of these finite complexes can be realized, it's going to look as follows. We have the derived limit in E star eco modules of E star modular powers of the maximal ideal converging to the E homology of the K and local sphere. And notice here, this really will be the E homology of the K and local sphere and not the completed E homology. The completed homology would be free of rank one. But we don't want to understand the K-local sphere K-locally, we already do. We want to understand what happens, for example, rationally. So we really are looking at the e-homology. And it turns out that e-homology is approximated by the derived limits in comodules. And then Hopkins made this conjecture, which is um, tells you what should happen in the edge case. What's the Lman minus one localization of a height of the K-localization of height and minus one complex. And he, he conjectures that if you look at these derived limits of, uh, so here I modded out by the first n minus two generators, then there are gonna be only two derived limits. One, recovering uh, what you started with in degree zero, possibly tensor with the p addicts, but that somehow the p completion appears if you're at height zero, it's still a 
let's ignore this for a little bit. And then you have another copy of uh, the same thing, but now with the n minus one inverted. And that's what uh, that's a form of the algebraic chromatic splitting conjecture, which does in fact imply the traditional chromatic splitting conjecture, at least in case. But it reduces it to this question of computing the right limits of completion in comodules. So when we saw that we of course were like, well, it's algebraic, so you can definitely compute it. And we were extremely wrong. Uh, like many things then at finite height, you can almost always reduce it to some algebraic question, which later just turns out to be completely intractable. But we were able to compute it a little bit. So here's what we are able to say about these columns, which is not nearly enough for algebraic chromatic splitting, not even close, but it's a beginning. So the first thing is we give a formula for these. So this derived colimit, let's say, I won't mod out by the generators because for this result, we don't have. So this is the approximation to the E homology of the K and local sphere. This can be written as the S cohomology of GN with coefficients in E homology of E. And again, the, the important part is I really mean this and not the complete one. Not the one where you can localize E tensor E first. For the first one, the cohomology would just be E star because you complete it. Here, the really the hard part is understanding E star E as it is before completing it first. And these higher derived limits have, can be expressed as cohomology of the Morava stabilizer group with coefficients in this more complicated thing. And the second part is we're able to compute the limb zero. So H zero GN E star E, yeah. that's E star tensor the PMs. Here already you see something weird. It's already uh, P complete and then you tensor with the PADX again. That's the kind of phenomena you have to deal with. And that's related to the fact that the E homology of the P, this is the E homology of the P complete sphere. If you don't P complete again, that's exactly what you would get. So this, uh, Note here is that this does uh, proves the algebraic chromatic splitting conjecture uh, for S equals zero. And another thing which is unrelated, which you can prove using slightly different ways, uh, although it's implied by this formula, uh, the terms the S minus one term, that's kind of easy to see has to be Bn minus one uh, is Bn minus one periodic. But of course, we don't know if it's just the Bn minus one inversion of what you get at s equals zero. But for formal reasons, because the cohomology does agree after you mod out by Bn minus one, after you mod out by the first and generators, it's going to be the same. It becomes complete. You see that whatever is the difference has to be Bn minus one periodic. So that's two things implied uh, by this formula. And that's of course how we, um, that's how we got interested in the spectral sequence based on Morava K theory at first. We were really studying the algebraic chromatic splitting and then we discovered that the ASS based on Morava K theory always converges and we're a little bit surprised why wasn't it described. As it turns out, it just happens to be the filtration by powers all over again, at least at large primes. I think an interesting, let me finish this with a question, uh, which I think could be the beginning of some kind of, uh, maybe not a way to attack the algebraic chromatic splitting, it's hard, but to make any sort of progress. I think an interesting question in general is like, can we describe E star E as a GN representation. So I think I'm uh, running a little bit out of time here, but uh, at height one, actually, at least morally, you can describe it. I think the details are a little bit fuzzy, but I think I know how to describe it at height one. Uh, and it does, you can see from this description immediately why the answer is what it is 
how do we exactly end up with something rational in H1? But these methods for this crime is highly equals one. It's somehow like everything in chromatic homo, like in all cases of chromatic homotopy theory, height one is anomalous in its simplicity. Uh, this description we have for height one, we're not quite sure how to generalize it for higher heights. But I think that's a very interesting question. That's a very, very strange GN representation. It's infinite dimensional. It's a filtered codimet of finite dimension of finite over E star representations. And we just don't know what it is. But somehow understanding what it is would give you some understanding towards chromatic splitting. That's the thing you really want to understand. Okay. Thanks so much for uh, listening and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. All right, let's thank the answer for the talk. Are there any questions that people would like recorded? Okay, let me turn off the recording then.